happy World Usability Day, everybody. The World Usability Day theme is inclusive design, which is written on the glass of this room. And so you can imagine when, when I saw the theme, because every year they come up with a new theme, and when I saw the theme for this year, of course, the only person I could think of was Yuta Trebranis, and she's the woman who founded this, this organization, the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University. And she said, perfect, we will definitely support you and, and host an event for you, which is why we're here. We're so lucky to be here and to have uh, the Inclusive Design Research Center uh, people. So on that note, I just want to introduce our hosts. They were kind enough to take time out of their evening to, to come and help us understand more about inclusive design and how to address it. Again, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I know we were promised some terrible weather. I was out there. It's not quite so bad, so I think we can brave the cold, but if, those, if some of you are maybe a little bit underdressed for the weather, um, the indoors would be nice as well. Uh, so my name is Lisa Liskavoy. I'm an, uh, an inclusive designer at the IDRC, and I also uh, coordinate a consultancy called Web Savvy. Um, so I work with organizations, companies, um, different institutions to help them make their communications on the web more accessible. Uh, we do training workshops, we do um, accessibility audits, we do consulting and that kind of uh, work. So what I wanted to talk to you about before we get out there um, and do the hit the pavement and do the mapathon um, is talk to you a little bit about it, design, <coughs> inclusive design and, and uh, what it actually means. So before I kind of give you my answer, I wanted to, to hear some of your answers. So do people want to share what they think about when they think about inclusive design, um, whether in your own work or just on a purely theoretical level? Um, just some ideas. Yeah. Um, I think today we design thinking, we design for everyone, but there are many sections of the population that we don't think about. So I see it as purely designing products which is accessible and when I say everyone, okay. So designing fairly for everyone. Anyone else? Yeah. I guess it's sort of like designing for the extreme use cases, like use cases where people are not able to access certain things, or uh, you know, it's like like basically you know, someone who cannot see or who cannot see colors or something like that, like an extreme use case of your product because that makes it easier for everyone. Exactly, yeah. So designing for edge cases, most definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a software designer, like, uh, uh, like years and years ago, the only kind of inclusive, you know, uh, inclusive design that we were thinking of was internationalization. And we didn't even call it international. Uh, we didn't even call it inclusive design. Mm -hmm. like, even in the same country, like, like, like Toronto. Uh, sure. We need to support me. Internalization is, internationalization is a great example. So even just kind of broadening our perspective a little bit to, um, to um, yeah, just have a, a little bit of a wider definition that includes more people. Um, so inclusive design is design that takes into consideration the full range of human experience. And that can be with respect to ability, it can be with respect to gender, language, um, culture, preferences, personalities, all of those things factor in. Um, so uh, as uh, some of you mentioned, most definitely not just designing for the average user, uh, but certainly considering the edge cases. So who falls um, on the tail, tail ends of the distribution and perhaps something that uh, those of us that have been taught to think of the average designer or the average user would consider as noise. Um, but not, not just uh, thinking about those cases, but actually kind of relishing in the opportunities that arise from thinking about the ed edges and thinking about the people who um, fall on the, on the far ends of, that, of those distributions, and there are many of them. Um, so I want to give you this quote. Um, it's by uh, Dan Formosa from Smart Design, and this is from the film Objectified, which I'm, I'm sure at least some of you have seen. And what he says is, we have clients who come to us and say, here's our average customer. Um, so she's female, she's 34 years old, she has 2.3 kids, and we listen politely and we say, well, that's great, but we don't really care about that user. 
what we really want to know, uh, what we re really want, need to do to design is to look at the extremes. So who is the weakest or the person with arthritis or the athlete or the strongest or the fastest person in the room? Because if we understand what the extremes are, the middle will, will take care of itself. So we spend so much time and effort thinking about that average user, that re kind of representative user, but that is going to be the user that's going to have the easiest time adapting to whatever design you put out there, to whatever product you put out there. So instead, if we think about those extremes, we're actually opening our eyes to opportunities that might not have otherwise been obvious. So I want to give you um, a couple of examples of cases, and these are maybe things you've heard before, but uh, when we think about these extreme cases, like I said, it, it really opens up some opportunity, and what we often refer to um, as curb cuts, so whether physical curb cuts or digital curb cuts. Um, is, uh, who, how many people here are familiar with the concept of curb cuts? Okay, so for those of you who are not, um, curb cuts are the, the actual physical cuts that are put into the curb, um, and those are put in there to allow people uh, who use uh, different mobility devices like wheelchairs to easily be able to get on and off the curb. Now, what happened was, uh, what happened was um, when these curb cuts were put in, what people quickly noticed was that there were so many different use cases for these, and actually so many different people within the population were benefiting uh, from these curb cuts who weren't wheelchair users. So you had mothers with strollers, you had fathers with strollers, you had uh, people with shopping carts, cyclists, uh, people using skateboards, uh, travelers with heavy luggage. Um, all of these people benefited from these curb cuts as well. And so we use it as a kind of umbrella term to refer to different kinds of inventions that arose in, uh, with the purpose of addressing some kind of gap um, that was uh, perhaps faced, faced by certain, uh, certain populations of people, but actually ended up having this kind of broader beneficial effect. So a couple of my favorite examples, the typewriter. Uh, so the typewriter was invented by um, an Italian man named Pellegrino Turi uh, in the 1800s. And the reason he invented the typewriter was because um, his lover was going blind. And so she was no longer able to send letters to her friends and family and him uh, and communicate in this way. And um, he wanted her to be able to continue to, to have those kinds of relationships with her friends and family. And so he created a device for her that she was able to use despite losing her sight. And of course, now we see a, some, some form of what you know, turned, uh, the typewriter turned into the keyboard, which we you know, use on, uh, on our computers, we use it on our mobile phones. It's kind of hard to even imagine a day, going a day without using some kind of keyboard interface, right? Mm -hmm. um, the next example is the electric toothbrush. How many people here use an electric toothbrush? So the electric toothbrush was created to help people with mobility uh, impairments um, to brush their teeth. And what I love about this example is it, it's a really great example of exactly how inclusive design forces us to think differently. Because what it does is it, it asks us to question our assumptions. So the assumption that a toothbrush needs to be used by kind of moving your hand over your teeth is really kind of a silly one because the goal is to brush your teeth, not to move your hand or how, like it. And when you, we think about inclusion in this way in our designs, we often end up facing the question of, well, what is the real takeaway? What is the real message? What is the real experience? Not just on a superficial level, but, but actually kind of at the heart of the matter. And this is uh, also one of my favorite examples of all times. How many people are familiar with the Eames chair? So probably one of the most iconic chairs in design. Um, the Eames chair was actually uh, developed kind of in a roundabout way as a response to uh, a design brief from the US Navy um, to Charles and Ray Eames. And the, the design brief was actually around creating a splints for, um, for people during World, World War II. And so they were looking for um, splints that were lightweight, that were very malleable, uh, and could adapt to different, different kinds of bodies, uh, but were also supportive enough that they could provide proper um, kind of uh, support um, for, for broken bones. And so they started to, um, uh, kind of experimenting with different types of materials and ended up coming up with this really neat kind of um, 
plywood material that, that was very malleable, that was very supportive, that was very light. And Ray Eames actually kind of fell in love with this material and she started experimenting with it and creating these beautiful sculptures um, using uh, this kind of jigsaw approach. Uh, and I, I strongly encourage you to look them up. They're, they're quite stunning. And then eventually it, it uh, kind of led to the birth of this chair because of the, the material innovation that came from the response to that design brief is what led to, um, to what we see here today. So we're talking about physical spaces, and so I want to show you some more examples of really beautiful things that can come out of considering the edge cases and considering um, use cases outside of the typical. So this is a video that was done by Vox, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I want you to, to mostly just watch the video. Six. Local train. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. We live in a world built for people who hear. Hello? But what would our man-made world look like and feel like if it were designed for those who don't hear? Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. is a school for the deaf and hard of hearing, and they are redesigning entire buildings based on the sensory experience of those who don't hear. We've only just begun, though, to challenge ourselves to examine how we could design entire buildings, entire campuses, or even cities to be aligned with deaf space. Deaf people as a culture have been marginalized largely. We've been, as a marginalized community, developing our own culture, and that defines what kind of place we call home, how we claim and occupy space. And so we've begun to ask ourselves these questions and because of that, gotten a lot more creative, begun to think bigger about how we can find different ways to align our ways of being to our environment. The classrooms are oriented in a semicircle or a U shape so that classmates can continually visually connect with other, other classmates. So if you want to be involved in a discussion, everybody has a front row seat to seeing. In a wider hallway, two people can walk in parallel signing with each other, but we do have specific distance parameters wherein we can observe the whole body and its signing. Hearing people, though, could disregard that kind of a distance requirement. They can be just next to each other, speaking to each other without that need for the visual field. Stairs also require a great deal more uh, visual attention to your footing. And so ramps reduce that. So if you're communicating with somebody while you're navigating a ramp, you can do so much more easily. Within deaf space, we have always relied on, you know, a heavily, uh, visible environment because we're not getting information uh, auditorily. So if you're sitting at the top of the terrace, you can see all the way to the bottom of the terrace. It's one distinct place uh, that can be unified or have three distinct areas. Color and lighting are highly aligned to communication access. Blues and greens will usually contrast with most skin tones enough to get to reduce eye strain. You may want to have more diffused lighting. Um, a lot of the lighting here is directional so that it can be aligned. But there are mirrors present to allow somebody to know and have a sense of what's happening behind them. Through the use of that reflection, they can know if somebody is nearing them behind them or if somebody taps them, they look up in their reflective space, lets them know who's there. Transparency of, say, doorways. So that when a person is in an office, they can either have a, a transparent doorway or passageway or one that's opaque. So that I can see lighting and shadow and movement, know that somebody's at the door, but not clearly see who's there. Very often, people refer to hearing loss as an example, which negatively frames the whole approach from the outset. 
But let's imagine the deaf baby who has never heard and yet is still described as experienced hearing loss. And instead we propose a different framing, that of deaf gain. What is it that we gain by the experience of being or becoming deaf? Deaf in space, I believe, is born of the idea that we have something to offer the world. That being deaf confers some very interesting perspectives of life. I think there were so many different examples of, of curb cuts that came from this kind of perspective uh, to the space and the, the design of the space. Can you think of some um, maybe elements that were mentioned in the film that you think would be beneficial to you as well or other users that you can think about or know? So, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Sure, or if you wanted to listen to your music, for example, without being distracted, right? Like it gives you more cues to the environment that you're surrounded in, and it still kind of allows you to keep, you know, maybe a, a certain level of separation from it um, if you chose to. Um, the hallways are, are a great example. So first of all, who wouldn't benefit from being able to look at the person who you're having a conversation with as you're walking? Um, taking away that stair barrier also means that somebody in a wheelchair can move around more easily. Um, it also means that if you're walking and texting or if you're looking on your phone, again, that cognitive load is no longer there. So you don't have to concentrate so closely on not hurting yourself as you're walking down the stairs. You can make it a more easeful stroll. It can be distracted if you want to. You can be really engrossed in a conversation with the person you're standing next to. Right? So there are all of these like really beautiful unintended consequences. Um, and I think the, the space is just so gorgeous, like it's well lit and you can see everything and you, you eliminate eye strain from, you know, if, if you're spending the whole day looking at people. Um, I could just talk on, on and on about this, but maybe this is something you can discuss uh, later on. Um, but I just wanted to share a couple of examples. So uh, I imagine the majority of you are working in the digital space, right? So you're working on um, applications or websites or something that is digitally based. And so you might be asking yourself the question, well, why am I here? Why am I doing this kind of very physical, very uh, real worldly activity? And how does this relate to my work? Um, so I wanted to point your attention to the fact that sometimes these physical experiences have very clear parallels with our digital experiences. Uh, so this is a great example. Um, uh, it's a sign that says, wheelchair ramp available, please ask at the counter. So this is a great example of something that we see online all of the time. It's these accessibility features that are hidden, that are completely inaccessible, that are sometimes inoperable. So you can't actually, if you are using something like an alternative navigation device or a screen reader, you can't even get to those features. Right? Or um, if you think about the, the kind of single step ramp, so a lot of businesses will have uh, a ramp to help people get in the door because they have one step. But what happens once they're in the door? Right? What happens when uh, you get past that initial barrier? Is it, is it just that you know, the bathroom is on the third floor and the hallways are too narrow and then the wheelchair can get in through the front but then actually can't navigate and move around through the business? Um, so similarly, we see the, the same kinds of things in the digital space. So it's great if your landing page is, is very accessible, but what happens after? How um, kind of in-depth is this process that you're going through when you're thinking about including everyone in your design decisions? So um, how many of you have, have heard of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines? Great. Fantastic. So uh, we often think about uh, digital accessibility in the context of these, um, of these accessibility guidelines. And I'm not going to get into the guidelines today. I just want to talk about the, the overarching design principles of WCAG. Um, and they're really quite wonderful. And I think you can apply them in the real world as well. So the, the four gu guidelines that we think about are perceivable. So can we see it? Can we hear it? Can we feel it? Can we perceive it through one of our senses? And just like we can think about it on the web, uh, we can think about it in the physical space. So if you're walking into a restaurant and you get a menu, is it large enough that you can read it? Is, it, uh, is the contrast high enough? Are the fonts readable enough? 
If you can't see it, is there somebody who can help you? Is there an alternative format to the menu? Is there another way that you can get at the same information? Uh, similarly, operable is a very easy one to, to imagine. So if you, you know, if you have a door, can you move it? Can you actually open it? Um, can you, uh, are the, the counters high enough that you can reach them? Are the tables at a height that is comfortable for everybody? Um, understandable, uh, I think signage is probably one of the best examples of this, right? We often uh, encounter, I think, confusing signage in, in businesses. And um, when I talk about accessibility, I often talk about this, this idea that something that is a very mild inconvenience to you, that you kind of scoff at or get annoyed or maybe even just laugh at, can cause a very significant barrier to somebody if they're facing a disability. So if it's a sign that's a little bit hard to understand for you, what is it like to somebody who maybe doesn't speak the language? What is it, what is it like to someone who's not as familiar to, with our symbol system um, or faces any kind of other cognitive barriers that might make it difficult to understand? So is it clear enough? So when you get out there, I want you to be thinking about these things. Um, and finally, robust, and I'll be honest, I had quite a bit of trouble thinking about a physical equivalent to robustness because in, um, when we talk about a robustness in the digital space, we talk about things like uh, it behaving reliably with different kinds of assistive technologies and it kind of being future-proof. Um, so what I could think about is if you think about uh, whether or not it, it behaves reliably, so let's say you have a ramp and your ramp can support a wheelchair. We know that wheelchairs, as time goes on, become more and more sophisticated. Uh, now they can do things like lift us up and make a stand, for example. Um, and as a result, they're getting quite a bit heavier. So we're no longer looking at a wheelchair that can be, you know, that a person can lift. It might be a wheelchair that weighs 300 pounds. And then if your ramp can support that, can it also support a heavier chair, right? Can it support a scooter? Can it support another assistive technology that maybe doesn't exist yet? Uh, and similarly, when we're thinking about future proofiness, um, does it work in different contexts? So if you have a ramp that a person can successfully use in the summer, are they going to be able to use it in the winter as well when it's icy, uh, when there's a lot of snow? Um, so think about these different contexts and whether some, some kind of assistive um, kind of feature that is in place uh, work, works across of different, different situations um, and also different use cases. Uh, so that's all I have for you today, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, and I'm not going to take up too much of your time because I want you to get out there or stay in here, but I want you to get to the Mouthathon activities. Uh, so I'll pass the mic on to Elijah. All right, so hello everybody. My name is Elijah Cameras Garland and I am the lead Mapathon coordinator for the Big Idea Project. As well, I'm one of the associate marketing directors, so you may have seen me slinking around the back of the presentation with a camera. Uh, if there's a photograph that Big Idea uses, it's most likely that I'm the one that took it. So you have no fear of regarding that. So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about Big Idea and our involvement with accessibility and mapathons. So in order to really understand what a mapathon is for, it's important for us to understand sort of how we view accessibility. So to kick things off, I want to do some quick word association. I just want you guys to say some of the first things that come to your mind. Um, just throw things out there. If I say accessibility, what do you think of? There are no wrong answers here, so just the first things that you say. Standards, perfect. What else do you guys think of? Yeah. Accommodations. Accommodations, perfect. Literally the first word that comes to your mind. Don't even think about it. Openness. Openness, perfect. Blind. Blind, perfect. Care. Care. So one of the big things that we need to look at, and I'm really glad that I heard some diverse answers from you guys, a lot of the groups that we talk to, some of the first things that we hear are stairs, ramps, elevators, that sorts of things. And one of the big things that we need to take a look at when we're looking at accessibility, especially when it comes to businesses, is that accessibility is much more than just the built environment. And that is what we do Mapathons for. Mapathons give us a chance to take a look at businesses from many different perspectives and understand what they're doing for accessibility beyond just the built environment, but also with regards to their customer service and their facilities. So what is a Mapathon? Mapathons are events where we get large groups of people together and we evaluate businesses based on certain criteria. Now, one of the big things that's important to mention, not only to business owners, but to the people that we're doing Mapathons with, is that these are not meant to point out deficiencies for businesses. These are meant in order to help businesses that might be having problems becoming more accessible. And this is in order to help us promote businesses that are accessible and that have accessible practices. 
So here are some of the examples of things that we look at when we do Mapathon evaluations. We look at, of course, the built environment as well. How accessible is the entryway? Do they have a stairwell that you need to go up? Do they have a ramp? Is the doorway wide enough to get into? Do they have an ability to navigate the interior once they're inside? Is there adequate lighting indoors for people with visual impairments to be able to read menus and signage and wayfinding? Is there guide dog access, adequate noise levels? Is there accessible parking? Do the staff go out of their way to make up for some deficiencies that they may have in their built environment? So for example, one of the biggest um, issues that we come across when we're doing mapathons is business owners that are willing to go above and beyond to help a person who might be using a wheelchair by helping them up a one-step entryway that they may have in front of their business. That still means that this business could be considered accessible even though it may not look like it from the outside. So the partner organization that we work with with Big Idea is a company called wheelmap.org. They're a German-based organization and what they do is they operate a service that's very similar to Google Maps. You can look up local businesses and find reviews about them. But instead of being reviews about things like the quality of food or the customer service, these are about their accessibility. Now, Wheelmaps reviews are quite simple in nature. Uh, so for example, I could look up a Scotiabank at Wellesley and Young and it will tell me that it is wheelchair accessible. Right off the bat, just clicking on the bank, I can see that if I were a wheelchair user, I can get in the door. In addition to that, you can give in um, extra details about customer service, um, services that might be available, as well as access to the washroom if they have one of those as well. And as well, there are businesses that do not have reviews available, and Wheelmap is one of the easiest um, organizations in the accessibility cloud to make a review for. You can simply click the organization and check off its accessibility levels. They also have a mobile application, so you're not just restricted to doing your reviews on the computer. And here you can see it's a little bit small and a little bit pixely, but when you have a review as an overall on Wheelmap, it shows you the name of the business, its accessibility level, its washroom access. You can upload photographs if there's anything that's worth taking a look at inside the store. Street views from several different perspectives, and as well, there is a comments section. And this is what's most important for us to take a look beyond the built environment, if there is something that they do customer service-wise to go above and beyond. If there is something exemplary about the business that you would not see simply by looking at its entryway, this is where you note it. Now, Wheelmap is a part of a greater organization called the Accessibility Cloud. Uh, just by a show of hands, have any of you heard of the Accessibility Cloud before? All right, fantastic. So Accessibility Cloud is a, a cooperative organization among many different mapping organizations like Wheelmap in order to create an open network of all of the different reviews among all sorts of different categories. So for example, Wheelmap is currently working on a new beta program that's going to fully introduce all of the details that come across from all different websites that are partnership organizations of the Accessibility Cloud. So you can see here, these are two different reviews and they have very different detail levels of their information. One of these would have come from the original Wheelmap website, which simply would list whether or not it's wheelchair accessible or whether or not there's access to the washrooms inside. And additional information would have come in on the extra comment section. Meanwhile, this review for the Bank of Nova Scotia would have come from a partner organization known as Access Map, which has specific fill-in spaces for can you get in with a guide dog? How um, accessible is the entryway? How accessible are the restrooms? Is there adequate lighting? These were all mandatory check items for an Access Map review. And as a result, having all of these reviews in one place means that they can combine these different reviews from different organizations into one clear and concise review across all of the inputs. So for example, a German user who might use Wheelmap in Berlin can access American reviews that were done by Access Map and vice versa. So to conclude, what Mapathons really give us a chance to do is to create a versatile usable network for people to understand the full accessibility of businesses and for a chance of those who participate in Mapathons to look beyond just the built environment and see all of the different ways in which businesses can embrace accessibility. Uh, I'm going to start distributing some Mapathon information forms so you can get a look at the kind of things that we would look at with regards to Mapathon reviews. So just right off the bat, name and address, self-explanatory. So these are going to be the name of the store and its address where it's located. The number of steps it takes to get in the front door. If you want to get a chance to sort of see what a five-star business looks like, I like to use the Scotiabank as an All example. Right. 
wide passages within. You can see with the double sided doors like this, if there were no button here, it would be very difficult to be able to get both doors open and for you and come inside. Around. Exactly. Okay. So if you get a business that doesn't have a washer, you can simply tell them not a problem.